Let's talk about define yourself. Number one, careful what you work for. As I didn't say careful what you wish for. Careful what you work for. You know, my grandfather, uh, God rest his soul, used to say, you know, if you make $10,000 a year, you put up with $10,000 worth of crap. If you make $100,000 a year, you put up with $100,000 worth of crap. So how much are you going to put up with? How much stress are you going to take on your life? You know, he used to say, you don't just want to make a living, you want to make a life. So you start off, when you guys get to college, you start your careers, a lot of people are motivated by money. Be careful what you work for, because if you win the rat race, you're still a rat, remember, okay? Number two, assign yourself. This is probably not the best audience for this. I'm sure you get a lot of homework assignments. But when I graduated from Duke, the uh, commitment speaker was a woman called Marion Wright Edelman. And she talked about assign yourself, meaning she used to come down at night and her dad would say, how come you're not doing your homework? And she said, well, I did it already. He said, okay, now go assign yourself some. So what are you going to do beyond what you've been assigned? My first job out of Duke was covering high school sports in New Haven, Connecticut. Learned the trade, had a good time, didn't make any money, but uh, you know, not, not a lot of glory in high school sports. On my off days, I asked if I could cover the New York Giants or the New York Knicks. These were not assignments that anybody had given me. And you're saying, hey, you know, it's fun covering the Giants, it's fun covering the Knicks, it's fun covering pro sports. But the fact is, this was my day off. I wasn't going to get paid anymore to do it. But I had enthusiasm for my job, and I understood that if I just waited for people to assign me to things, that I would never get anywhere, that I would never get out of the haven. So, uh, assign yourself. Be competitive, not comparative. This is something that John Wooden talked about a lot. Peace of mind. John Wooden, in 27 years, 29 years of college coaching, never mentioned the word win. Nobody won more than John Wooden. He never talked about winning. Some people say, well, the reason why he never talked about winning was because winning just wasn't that important. No. No. You don't win 10 national championships because winning is not important. The reason why he never talked about winning is because he didn't want his players thinking about score. He didn't want his players thinking about the other team. He did not scout opponents. He did not deliver long scouting. He Let's worry about us. Let's just do our best. And if we do our best, the scoreboard will take care of itself. Maybe you're successful, but the other team has more points. And just because you beat a team doesn't mean that you were successful and that you reached your potential. This is something, by the way, that uh, Coach K talks a lot about at Duke. The way he says it is, run your own race. You know, someone's always going to have a bigger house or more money or more fame or more quote-unquote success. Run your own race. Figure out who you are, what you want to accomplish, and run your own race. Number four, treat everybody well all the time. Think about that for a second. Everybody and all. Treat everybody well all the time. Now look, we all get snappish. I'm as guilty as anybody. You say things you shouldn't. But what happens a lot is when people sort of blow their stack and lose their temper, they're usually talking to someone who's quote unquote below them. And you know, Al McGuire, who was a longtime coach at Marquette and, and broadcast, used to say, don't shout down, shout up. You know, like, you might think just because you're on TV talking about the Final Four that you're more successful or you're cooler than some guy driving a garbage truck. But well, let me tell you, it depends on your perspective. I have three boys, ages 800. Believe me, the guy driving a garbage truck is a lot cooler than their dad. I'm just somebody else who's on TV and they'd rather be watching SpongeBob SquarePants. So if you're treating everybody well all the time, first of all, I just think it's a better way to be. But eventually, almost everybody that you come to contact with, remember I talked about the team, please? You're gonna come in contact with them down the line. The person that you disrespect or you blow your stack at today might be the guy or a gal that you are applying for a job with tomorrow. So treat everybody well all the time. Number five, about defining yourself. Beware of rabbits. <coughs> Beware of rabbits. Now, I got this from two uh, basketball coaches. But ironically, they were both fired by Indiana. <coughs> One of them worked for Oklahoma, too. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Bobby Knight. You guys have heard of Bobby Knight, I hope? Like, yeah, he's the ESPN broadcaster, right? Yeah, that Bobby Knight. Coached in Indiana for a long time. Very volatile personality. He used to say that if you spend all your time focusing on rabbits and chasing rabbits, 
you're going to get stumped by the elephant that you don't see. So this has to do with you know, commitment and spending your time and your energy. Are you worried about big things or are you worried about small things? And if Bobby Knight had taken his own advice, he would probably still be the coach in the end. Uh, the other guy is Kelvin Sampson. He used to work at home with an influence in Indiana. You know, he, used, he used to say to me, you know, if you chase two rabbits, you're not going to catch either one. So this involves your commitment. You know, I remember when I first interviewed uh, Mike Krzyzewski at Duke uh, for my television show down there. And, I, and he, said to, he said to me, I want to go to the Final Four every year. I want to win a national championship every year. And I said, well, there's 300 coaches around the country that want to be in the Final Four every year. He said, but there are 300 coaches who believe it. Just like all the students could say, we want to get A's in our courses. Well, everybody wants the grade, but are you willing to put in the work to get the grade? That's what Kelvin Sampson used to say, you take a, a plate of bacon and eggs. He said, well, the chicken worked real hard to make that meal, but the pig was committed. So what are you committed for? What is, what is your skin worth to you? You wear rabbits. Number six, don't be afraid to say three very important words. I don't know. I don't know is going to get you a long way in this world. You know, John Wooden liked to talk a lot about preparation. He used to say, uh, failure to prepare is preparation to fail. So you need to be pre as prepared as you can and learn as much as you can. But at the end of the day, if you don't know something, don't be afraid to say, I don't know. This goes back to trust. I'll tell you another Coach K story. One of his first dates with his wife, Mickey, they went to some dance or something. And they're having this romantic time. It's very early in their relationship. And, and midway through the evening, he confesses to her that he actually asked another girl to the dance before her. And she had said no. And so Mickey was kind of taken aback and she kind of batted her eyes and she says, well, then I was your second choice? Tell me I was your second choice? And he says, well, no, there was actually another girl that I asked. And she said no. But you were third. So she's put off by that, right? But what was he saying to her? You can trust me. I will tell you the truth. So if you pretend to know something you don't know, you're basically telling that person that they can't trust you. And believe me when I tell you, from experience, and unfortunately experience usually just means screwing up. So when you make mistakes and you screw up, it's okay, because that's how you learn. But I can tell you from experience, if you pretend to know something that you don't know, it will be discovered in very quick time. So now you look silly twice over, right? First, because you didn't know what you're supposed to know. And second, because you tried to pretend to know something that you didn't. So don't be afraid to say, I don't know. Be who you are. Define yourself. Be who you are. And if you don't know something, I don't know. Number seven, be a good teammate. This is something I love about probably people in sports is you learn to be a good teammate. How many of you guys know who Clark Kellogg is? Is that name ring the bell? Played a while back? Okay, he's the CBS broadcaster on the Final Four. When I first started at CBS, they brought me in the studio to sit next to Clark. And, you know, I didn't play in case you haven't picked up on that yet. He was a great, great player at Ohio State. Went into the NBA and, and had to cut short his career because of injury. And he could have easily been threatened by me being there. You know, it used to be just him in the studio, and now I'm next to him, and he played, and I didn't. I don't even know how familiar he was with my work. But I've had no better teammate than Clark Kellogg. There was nobody who was more gracious and accepting and helpful. Sometimes some things would come up and only one of us could speak about it on television. He'd say, you take it, you take it. So the takeaway from that might be, you know, well, Clark Kellogg has no ego, right? Well, he must have no ego. Wrong. Clark Ego has a huge ego. He has an enormous ego. And because he is so confident in himself and who he is, he's not threatened. He can be a good teammate. And a lot of coaches, John Calipari likes uh, to make this remark. It's amazing how much you can do if nobody cares who gets the credit. Be a good teammate. Don't be afraid to be selfless. Don't be afraid to let somebody else get the teammate, get the, get the credit and the glory. Number eight, fear failure. Now, this is different than what most people will tell you. Don't be afraid to fail. You hear that all the time, right? Don't be afraid to fail. Well, I think fear is the ultimate motivator. You know, I remember when I first started working from home in Sports Illustrated, people would say to me, well, I can't, how do you get motivated? You're working from home. You know, I need the office. So well, here's how it works. They give me an assignment, and if I don't do the assignment, they fire me. So it's not hard to get motivated. When I first started at, at the magazine, 
uh, I was what's called a fact checker, where you check stories. And if something was in, wrong in the story, a reader would write a letter. And that letter would, wouldn't go to the writer, wouldn't go to the editor. It would go to the fact checker. I learned to fear that challenge. It's a great motivator. Now, fear should never stop you from trying things. But that fear will help you prepare. It will help you. Go. So you go, if you're afraid of a test or you're afraid of a situation, embrace that fear and use it to your advantage. Feel for it. Fear failure. Number nine. This might be the most important thing I say to you guys today. Read. I beg of you, for your sake and for mine, read. And I worry about young people today with Facebook and Twitter. And I've already told my boys there will never be an expert, uh, Xbox in this house. There will never be a Wii in this house. Uh, when I say read, I'm really primarily talking about nonfiction and things that interest you, by the way. You know, when I was a kid, I used to read Mad Magazine. And my dad would always say, well, great, read Mad Magazine. Reading is learning, and the difference between where you are, the road between where you are and where you want to go is paved with books. So I encourage you to turn off the computer, put down the video game, read about something that interests you. It doesn't have to be heavy, it doesn't have to be serious, but reading will separate you from the people who are going to be competing be competing with you uh, for the job that you want. And the last part about uh, defining yourself is be grateful. A lot of times I'm asked, well, who is your favorite player to cover? And the answer is always the same. It's a guy named Juan Dixon. Anybody heard of Juan Dixon? It was kind of a while ago. Okay. Juan Dixon played for the University of Maryland. And he grew up in the inner city of Baltimore. Had one of the most uh, difficult upbringings that you can imagine. Both of his parents were heroin addicts who died of AIDS while he was in high school. And he was raised by grandparents and family. There was a lot of love in his life and a lot of love in his family, but he didn't have his parents. When he was a senior in high school, he was six foot three, 150 pounds. This was not somebody who was earmarked for greatness. And one day, the Maryland coach, uh, Gary Williams, was watching a, an AAU basketball game, a summer basketball game, and it was an empty gym, and it was late at night, and it was a 20-point blowout, and the game didn't matter. And he was looking at this kid from Baltimore, and the ball went out of bounds, and he dove in the stands to try to save the ball from going out of bounds. And Gary thought, there's something about this kid that I like. Still like your Martin the Great. You fast forward four years later, uh, year was 2002, Juan Dixon leads Maryland to the national championship. It was an All-American, made every big shot down the stretch. Now during the season, I got to know Juan a little bit, because I was interviewing him, and you know, we kind of established this report. So as I mentioned, one of my jobs at the Final Four is to interview people and gather information for the person writing the story. Well, I knew the guy who produced the NCAA's video about the Final Four. And he always let me in the room to listen to his interviews. So I had a little bit of exclusive access to the coach and his players who come through. So I'm sitting there with my notebook and I'm gathering my quotes. And Gary Williams comes through and he does his interview. Hi, Gary, a couple of the players come through. Juan Dixon comes through, and he sits and he does his interview. And when the interview's over, he walks over to the camera, and he sticks out his hand, and he says, thank you. And the guy's kind of look. this is like the 10th interview they've done. The guy looks at me like, you're welcome. And there are maybe eight or 10 people around the room, sound people, technicians, engineers, editors, interns, whoever. And Juan goes over to someone sitting in the corner, he sticks out his hand, he says, thank you. He says, you're welcome. And he walked around the room. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All the way around. He came to me back. And he came up to me and he said, Seth. And I remember that he said my name. Because at this point I wasn't doing any television. And most of the people didn't bother really learning my name. People I interviewed didn't really bother learning my name, much less things to say it back to me. He said to me, Seth, thanks for everything you did for me, man. I really appreciate it. And like everybody else, I'm a little taken aback. I said, Juan, well, it was an honor to watch you play. Of course, you've done far more for me by granting me the access to him. And what I realized in that moment is that is why Maryland won the championship. Because the one guy in the building who had the most reason after losing his parents to AIDS while he was in high school and going through everything and nobody trying to recruit him out of high school, the one guy who had the most reason to feel proud about what he had done was the most grateful person in the entire building. 
And that is what makes a champion. It's not the fact that they won the game. Because if they had lost the game, Juan Dixon still would have been a champion. So I leave you with that, that wherever you go, whatever you do, you're going to encounter adversity in your life. You're going to have setbacks. Believe me, life is full of rejection. And if you don't believe in yourself, no one's going to believe in, in you for you. But along the way, you will be able to withstand setbacks and adversity and disappointment. If you're just grateful for the little things. Everybody in this room woke up this morning. And you could see, you could hear, you could put your left foot in front of your right, and you could walk, and you could breathe, and you could come to a great school like this. These are all miracles. These are all miracles. So in your path to define yourself, keep your humility, keep your gratitude, follow your heart, trust your instincts, and whatever success means for you, that's what you'll get. And just remember, once in a while, you may have to interview a naked family. Okay? So that's define yourself. <laughs>